Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. Welcome to In the Frame, Exploring the DIA. I'm Graham Beale, your guide to the Detroit Institute of Arts. Today we're going to look at portraiture. And the DIA has thousands of portraits in its collection, covering many different civilizations and made about, with just about any kind of material that you could think of, from marble to bronze, from stone uh, to clay. And portraits have played different roles in different societies. And if I, but if I had to define what a portrait was, I would say that it's a likeness of an individual with a particular goal in mind. The individual being painted, sometimes painting him or herself, wants to project a particular image. Most of the time these images have been used for official purposes and they tend to show people being rather grand, uh, never smiling, sedate, often with great architecture around them to show how they, important they were. These are called these are the official uh, portraits. At the other end of the spectrum, we have individuals like Van Gogh, who painted himself over and over again. The only artist really to rival Rembrandt in the number of self-portraits that he made. And Van Gogh was showing the way that his moods changed. He was trying to project what he felt about the world. And so in this picture here, you see this, the face is slightly wonky. Most people's faces aren't perfectly symmetrical. Um, and it's balanced by the hat. And he's looking at us rather guardedly, rather warily, as if he doesn't really trust uh, what's going on in the world. But it's a very famous portrait. It's always being requested for exhibitions around the world. It was most recently seen in Paris a year or so ago, where it was the street banner that announced the exhibition throughout uh, Paris. In fact, it's traveled so much that we're beginning to become a little worried about the condition, and we may be keeping it here for quite a while. And here we are at another self-portrait from the late 19th century. It's by James Abbott McNeil Whistler. It's very loosely painted, but it has a very different effect from the Van Gogh. Whistler was the leader of a movement called the Aesthetic Movement that tried to turn the whole of life into beauty, beautiful things around you, everything had to be exquisitely done. It's said that Whistler once sent back a salmon because the color of the salmon clashed with the color of the, of the plate. Uh, here you see him standing, looking at us, or if maybe he's not looking at us. I can never make up my mind whether those eyes do actually look straight at us. He may be looking over our shoulder, and his head is tilted back a little bit to give greater silhouette uh, to the hat. Here he's holding his brushes in one hand, and a number of people have been confused by the fact that this looks as if the arm comes down here, across here, it's his left uh, hand apparently, his left arm apparently, and then suddenly the right hand uh, appears. By making this particular pose and gesture, Whistler is telling the world that he thinks that he's as good an artist that ever existed, because in the National Gallery of London, where Whistler worked, there are two pictures that use this particular technique. An extraordinary 1640 portrait by Rembrandt, uh, self-portrait by Rembrandt, and a portrait by Titian of a man with a huge blue sleeve. So what Whistler is doing here is claiming his place um, in the history of art as a truly great um, artist. He was important, he was very influential on both sides of the Atlantic. He was an, an, an American by birth, although all of his art uh, was made in Europe. But he had a terrific uh, impression. It's just that the art movement that he championed turned out not to have uh, much lasting power, although it has come back uh, very recently. But he has painted here these very loose strokes, as it's called arrangement in gray, and Whistler would insist that this isn't so much a self-portrait as it is a very, very careful composition uh, based on his own likeness. The idea of a portrait 
as a highly realistic rendering of an individual is probably less rare than the use of portraiture to express something as a symbol. Behind me are two of Rome's emperors, the first Augustus and the fifth Nero. Roman visual culture was dominated by Greek art and particularly they inherited the mantle of the art that had been produced by Alexander the Great. And the portrait bust of Augustus is a rather subtle combination of the idealized versions coming from Alexander the Great and the actual features of Augustus himself, the small mouth, the rather strangely shaped flat sort of head uh, that he has. One difference in this, though, is that the eyes are larger. Other busts and portraits of Augustus have him having small, rather close together eyes. So you see this mixture here. This kind of sculpture would have been put in cities across the uh, Roman Empire uh, to express the power and the ubiquity of, uh, of Augustus's rule. The portrait of the young Nero um, shows even more realism though than the Augustus piece. The Romans were at heart, I think, engineers and there was a kind of a no-nonsense feeling to their art and so when they did portraits they much more emphasized the individual than was common in the Greek tradition. And you can see the young Nero here uh, with his rather large nose and his extraordinary jug ears and the rather relatively straight uh, hair. Claudius, who when he announced that Nero was going to be the emperor, it turned out to be a pretty bad decision, uh, would have had these sculptures placed around the Roman Empire to let people know that this was the coming um, emperor. So both of these portraits symbolize power as much as convey a, an individual personality. But there's still another way that you can mix portraiture with symbolism if you just come this way. With these four sculptures, we move to the very eastern end of the Roman Empire. In fact, with these two, probably a little bit beyond it. Alexander the Great is credited with conquering Afghanistan, although he really won a couple of battles and kept moving through. Uh, but in this sculpture here, you see the Greek, the Hellenistic tradition, blending with other traditions, Buddhist sculpture, Indian uh, sculpture. The man on the right there is fairly recognizable. He looks pretty much like an individual with his particularly shaped nose and his furrowed brows. But the, this portrait on the right is of a bodhisattva, an individual who's nearly uh, reached uh, perfection. Um, and uh, that is reflected in the slight smile and in, in the eyes, the, the hooded eyes here that shows a kind of otherworldly um, uh, existence. In fact, it's probably stretching it to call that a portrait at all. Whereas those two sculptures there, you see the two gentlemen from Palmyra, an extraordinary trading part in an area of the world that we now call, is now known as Syria. And here we have these individuals carved. It's not superb carving, but we can see that they were in fact uh, different people. And the more dominating feature here is of course the eyes. These were funerary sculptures. They were put in a particular niche um, in a place where people could go and remember these particular individuals. But with the eyes, we see that they're looking into eternity. As it was said, the eyes are the window of the soul, and they certainly have plenty of soul. We're standing in one of the most dynamic and most beautiful galleries in the museum. It's devoted to the great Italian family, the Medici. And on either side of me, you, we have uh, two extraordinary portraits, one of Eleonora of Toledo, uh, the great um, patron, uh, the only daughter of the Viceroy of Naples, who married the uh, gentleman behind me, Cosimo de' Medici, who was the first Medici Grand Duke. Uh, he became Duke in 1737. They married in 1739, and she was to bear him 11 children. This is an extraordinary portrait, a dynastic portrait, uh, a portrait meant to show her off as really the first first lady in Italy. Agnolo Bronzino was one of the great uh, portrait painters. He was the favorite court painter to Cosimo de' Medici, and he painted this portrait of Cosimo's wife, Eleonora of Toledo, and her son, which most people believe is Giovanni, uh, in about 1745. Uh, this is a portrait that glorifies the power of the of the uh, wife of the ruler, uh, and it shows her also as the regal child bearer. She is holding her arm uh, over the 
shoulder of her son, Giovanni, and she has this wonderful symbol of the pomegranate. Both of these are symbols of fertility, and the Medici family had almost become extinct uh, prior to Cosimo de' Medici, but it was Cosimo who married Eleonora in 1539, and she was to bear him some 11 children, two of whom became Grand Dukes like Cosimo de' Medici. This son, Giovanni, alas, died of malaria in 1562, like his mother and one of his brothers. Uh, we see an extraordinary dress, a dress that is made of a beautiful Florentine cut velvet, uh, a white silk, and embroidered with gold thread. We know that Eleonora kept some 10 to 12 uh, weavers working in Florence at her workshop, weaving in gold and precious materials, and the, uh, the snood, or the hairpiece, is woven in gold by her Sm Spanish uh, uh, handmaiden or servant. Uh, this is in a wonderful frame that is uh, of the Medici period of the late Renaissance. Sometimes we call this the maniera or the mannered period because everything becomes uh, very sort of elaborate and courtly. We see a certain formal iconic uh, presence with Eleonora, the cold sort of almost ice-like skin, but it's to give a sense of power and uh, regality uh, to this state portrait. This is one of uh, two that were made. Another is in Florence in the Tribune Gallery of the Uffizi, and it has even a more elaborate background, a background in a rich ultramarine blue. This has a slate gray background, and if you look carefully in the distance, you can see the River Arno, which bisects Florence. We know that Eleonora was a great patron of the arts, that people often came to her, or at least the aristocrats, when they couldn't, uh, when they weren't allowed to meet with her husband, who was often traveling. So she, in effect, was the regent of Tuscany and is portrayed here in what is probably the first great state portrait, uh, certainly in Italy, and one of the great treasures in the Detroit Institute of Arts. Towering over me is this extraordinary marble portrait of Cosimo I, the first Medici Grand Duke. It was made toward the end of his life and shows a compassionate uh, an enlightened uh, ruler. It shows him in all of his realism. We see the uh, intricate beard, we see the mole or wart really on his face, something we knew he had. We see him, interestingly enough, portrayed as a Roman, as the Roman Emperor Augustus, or in the style of the Roman Emperor Augustus, who was also an enlightened uh, leader of his people in ancient Roman times. And Cosimo, like others at his court uh, in the Renaissance period looked backward to antiquity and to portraying themselves in the guise of an antique ruler. We have here Cosmo dressed uh, in a Roman paludamentum or cloak tied with a clasp or fibula. Cosimo chose to identify himself with Augustus because both he and Augustus were born under the same uh, ascendant sign of Capricorn and interestingly enough also was Charles V the uh, Habsburg Emperor, about whom I think you heard earlier. Um, we have the sculpture itself, made in a beautiful Carrara marble, uh, was carved by Giovanni Bandini del Opera, uh, who was one of the pupils and great followers of Michelangelo. They worked together in the Medici Academy, and in about 1572, Bandini carved this bust of Cosimo de Medici to immortalize him. Uh, to show him as the enlightened ruler, the uh, ruler who had uh, taken Florence, expanded it, consolidated it, and established the dynasty. Uh, it was some nearly 30 years prior to that that Bronzino, who was also a follower of Michelangelo, had painted the beautiful portrait of Eleonora. But this sculpture is one of uh, only five known works of Cosimo that were sculpted by Bandini and this is one that was kept indoors because you can see it is not weathered. It still retains the uh, wonderful carving in the marble. We were very fortunate to acquire it in the 1990s and it became an icon for our own international exhibition with Florence entitled Michelangelo the Medici and the Art of Late Renaissance Florence, an exhibition that hundreds of thousands of people enjoyed in Detroit at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 2003. So we're very fortunate to have this piece 
this great uh, marble along with the wonderful uh, portrait of his wife. In this room with other works, the armor that his grandson, Cosimo II, wore, the sculptures that he commissioned, as well as important Medici porcelain and Pietra Dura that all reflect the great largesse and enlightened uh, cultural status of the Medici court in the 16th century. Picasso is perhaps one of the most important masters of the European art history, and surely the most influential artist in Europe in the 20th century. The Detroit Institute of Art owns a good collection of Picasso paintings, among which one of my favorite is the portrait of Manuel Pallares. Manuel Pallares was a friend of Picasso. They studied together in school. And in 1909, Picasso made a visit to Pallares in the little village of Horta de Ebro in Tarragona and make this portrait of him. At the beginning of the 20th century, many artists lived in Paris. And they were very much interested in three things. The paintings by Cézanne, the art of Africa, the masks, and also in the starting of a new fashion of painting, which broke with the Renaissance tradition called the Cubism. Picasso actually was the founder of this movement. This painting has the three ingredients. First of all, you can see the way that Picasso applied the paint. This hatching technique is very much connected to the works of Cézanne, to the Cézanne technique. Also, the way that the head, the face of Manuel Parallares is rendered reminds us the features of the African masks. Finally, if you see the fashion in which the jacket is portrayed, is painted with these folding and unfolding areas using geometrical figures, Picasso is telling us about his interest of starting a new way of painting called the Cubism. These three ingredients, the art of the sun, the African masks, as well as the starting of the Cubism, are also found in one of the most important paintings ever done by Picasso, of course, in the 20th century. I'm referring to the Demoiselle d'Avignon at the MoMA in New York. Both paintings share the same importance in terms of our history if we look at these three ingredients. However, the DIA painting has something else, some piece of information that is actually written in the painting. And it's this inscription that reads, A mi queridísimo amigo Pallares, recuerdo de su amigo Picasso. To my dearest friend Pallares, in memory of our friendship. This is telling us that Picasso actually, to, to make this painting, used his personal feelings. And that's what makes the DIA work much more appealing, because it was a dear work for the artist. Renoir is perhaps one of the more sensual and most beloved Impressionist artist. To the beauty of his models, we have to, to add the quality of his colors, the softness of his colors. It looks as if he had painting, painted off these colors with velvet. He has this velvety quality. Renoir is perhaps one of the most sensual artists, and for sure, one of the most beloved Impressionist painters. To the beauty of his models, we have to add the softness of his colors. It looks as if he has painted all these colors with velvet. There is a velvet quality to his paintings. Traditionally, 16th, 17th, and 18th century artists would represent their models as a way of study. It was sketches, it were studies that the artist would afterwards put, up, put aside. Here, Renoir is telling us 
that he is representing a model as means of study, but at the same time is bringing this study, this sketch, into the heights of a finished work of art. This is the modern portrait. Born in 1741, Charles Wilson Peel was one of the greatest American painters of the late 18th and early 19th century. And this, this 1822 portrait of his older brother James Peel, is one of the greatest early 19th century American paintings, not just in the DIA, but anywhere. The subject of this painting, the artist James Peel, was a portrait painter who specialized in miniatures, delicate paintings often kept as keepsakes, as memorials of loved ones. And here he's looking at a portrait by his daughter, Anna Claypool Peel, of his niece, Rosalba Peel. To his left is a beautiful argan lamp, burning oil, giving generous light that he's using to examine the portrait miniature. And to his left, on the desk, the tools of his trade, the tools of his abandoned trade, a miniature brush, a miniature pad containing oil paints. I say abandoned trade because at this point in his life, James was 83 years old and no longer painting. Charles Wilson Peale's most important paintings, including full-length heroic portraits of George Washington, were largely painted in the 18th century. For much of the early part of the 19th century, he was a businessman running the first important museum in the United States. Then, late in his life, in his 70s and early 80s, after he had essentially retired from business, he took up the brush again, painting numerous delicate, moving paintings, often of family subjects, like this delicate, careful subject of his older brother, James Peel. This portrait is very different from the portraits we were looking at before, focusing on the details of this figure's distinctive life. It's James Peel not as a type, not as the type of a businessman or the type of a genteel woman, but as a man who's been through much, who's lived a hard life, who's wearing the medal that came from his service in the American Revolution. It's a portrait, if you will, warts and all, like the two warts we see just to the left of his mouth. The DIA's collection of American art is one of the three or four strongest anywhere in the world. And we have many priceless treasures of which this miniature by Anna Claypool Peel, showing her cousin Rosalba Peel, is one of the most moving for me as a curator. The museum acquired the great portrait of James Peel in 1950, and three years later, through Daga detective work, we were able to acquire the miniature that Peel is shown admiring in the painting. Now, visitors to the DIA can enjoy both the portrait and the portrait miniature simultaneously. Even though I'm from a small town in northern Michigan, I went to school out of state, and when I came back for law school in Ann Arbor, I discovered the museum at that time. In order to get away and provide a more round experience to my life, I wanted to get some culture, and I heard that the museum was a great place to come. I came my first year of law school and fell in love with it instantly in the collections that it has here. The museum's cultural base that provides for the city of Detroit is a unique backdrop for any business that wants to come to the city of Detroit, any visitor that wants to come to the city of Detroit, anybody who wants to live here in the city of Detroit. You have this opportunity with a great institution, with a world-class collection to bring your children, your family, your parents, any of your friends to visit the city of Detroit. I went to school out of state. Most of my friends couldn't find Michigan on a map, but whenever they come to visit and whenever they come to see this museum, uh, they are singularly taken away. Uh, their breath is taken away by the collection itself and the offerings here at the museum. I think the Detroit Institute of Arts is critical to the redevelopment of the city of Detroit. It provides a haven of knowledge and insight uh, for any family in the city, outside of the city, in the suburbs, in northern Michigan to come and learn about art from all over the world of any culture, of a variety of cultures throughout the world. Uh, and it is uh, you know, a collection that uh, is, I learn something new from every time I'm here. Uh, the uh, museum is critical because it attracts visitors to the city of Detroit and provides a unique uh, cultural background for the city of Detroit that is uh, vibrant and always changing and always providing new opportunities for everyone who walks through its doors.
Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of In the Frame, looking at portraiture. As you've seen, a portrait can convey much more than just a simple likeness. Why don't you come down and see what some of the images convey to you? You can get all details about the DIA on dia.org. Until next time, this is Graham Beale, your guide to one of America's great museums, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Support for In the Frame, Exploring the DIA is provided by Masco Corporation Foundation. Masco is a global manufacturer of home improvement and building products. An encore presentation of In the Frame is available on demand for viewing at DetroitPublicTV.org.